Okay, Neil, we're back again. Thank you again for your time. I'm really looking forward to our conversation. We're talking um, this time about stress. Now, this seems to be a major, major problem these days. And would you say that you're also finding this in your interactions with those that you serve? Yeah, very much so. Wherever I go, wherever I do, people are talking about um, stress. And it, it, it does bother me it does worry me uh, that this is such an issue because stress can do so much harm it can really ruin people's uh, lives so I think it's essential that we take this um, subject seriously and and do what we can to address it very much so. So would you say that um, managers need to take more responsibility for the stress that they um social workers experience and and actually been able to manage it and and address the stress issue within the workplace yeah uh, as i see it managers have a twofold responsibility first of all they're man they're responsible for managing their own pressures to make sure that they don't get stressed because let's face it if they get stressed they're not much used to um the people they they manage so there are lots of self-care issues there and making sure that they keep their workloads within manageable limits. So that's one side of their responsibility. Then the other side of their responsibility, of course, is to make sure that their staff, their supervisees are not getting stressed, that they're not getting overloaded, that workloads are within manageable limits. Now, I know there's a huge amount of work. The work just keeps coming, but there's no point giving people more work than they can cope with because they just be, that's counterproductive. They actually achieve less. Yeah. If they're stressed, they're worried, they're anxious, they're uh, in yeah. danger of going off sick. Uh, they're not being creative. They're not learning uh, and, and so on. It just creates a vicious circle really. Okay. Um, but what I would say though, is that um, one of the problems in terms of um, managers supporting their staff and taking responsibility is uh, this has to go through the management hierarchy so um, managers need to get support from their managers and those managers need to get support from their managers the, ho the whole system in a sense needs to be geared towards keeping pressures within manageable limits um, otherwise uh, the whole thing just becomes um, dangerous from a health and safety point of view so I'm hearing you talk about it needs to, it's the hierarchy. What happens at the top affects what happens at the bottom. Yeah, very, very, very much so. I think a lot of it is around um, leadership. And to my mind, a key aspect of uh, leadership is shaping the culture in a positive direction. And a key part of that uh, idea of culture is morale. You know, people often use motivation and morale interchangeably as if they're the same thing, and they're not. Um, the difference is motivation is psychological and morale is sociological. And what I mean by that is whether you're motivated is up to you, whether I'm motivated is up to me. Uh, motivation is an individual thing, whereas morale is a collective thing. Mm -hmm. It's the atmosphere, it's the culture, it's the ethos in a sense. Mm -hmm. And if what you've got is a, a culture of low morale, then that just deflates everybody. It makes the work much harder. And so um, trying to instill a higher level of morale is an important leadership um, challenge. But unfortunately, uh, in my experience, a lot of people are not clear about that. So either they don't do it, or they do it in a very simplistic way. You know, they just go along trying to jolly people along and cheer them up and, and, and stuff like that. And that's, that's like the equivalent of saying to a depressed person, why don't you cheer up? You know, that mm -hmm. it's just, um, at best, it's worthless. And at worst, it's, it actually makes the situation worse. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with that. 100%. I, I think you've, you've hit so many nails on the head there. And I guess I want to ask you then, how important would you say culture is within the workplace, uh, you know, the organisational culture and all of this stuff around stress and, you know, managing caseloads and the like? For me, it's, it's, it's crucial because the, uh, a culture is very powerful. It's mm. one of the most powerful things in an, in an organisation. And one of the reasons it's powerful 
is because it influences us without our knowing it. Yes. Um, if I try to influence you, for example, then you will know I'm trying to influence you and you can resist that influence. But if you're being influenced in a way that you're not aware of, it's just because that's the norm, that's what happens every day, then that has much more um, power over you in a sense. So if you've got, for example, a culture that's negative, cynical, defeatist, if you've got a culture that is, in a sense, unhealthy, then what it does is it creates vicious circles. Um, so what you'll have is a, a group of people who are struggling with their workload. And then uh, as a result of that, a negative, uh, low morale culture develops. And if that low morale culture isn't uh, challenged and transformed through good leadership, then what that does is it drags people down. So the, the lower morale is, the less energy there is for people. And, and so that makes the job more difficult. The more difficult the job is, the more people struggle to cope. The more people struggle to cope, the more likely they get to, are to get stressed. The more stressed they are, the lower morale will be. So can you see what's happening? There's a vicious circle. Oh, no effect. <clears throat> yeah, there's a vicious circle develops. And then that vicious circle can lead to other vicious circles. So one uh, vicious circle I'm very aware of is where there's a lot of stress, is people start to think that stress is normal. So um, um, uh, I've lost count, for example, the number of times I've had to challenge people when they say things like, social work is a stressful job and I've had to say no social work is a pressurized job or if you're stressed by it if in other words if the um, level of pressure is doing you harm then that's telling you there's something wrong either in terms of the level of the workload the, the support you're getting or lack of support or whatever or it's the culture that is dragging people down but um, <clears throat> if social work or a stressful job it means that everybody in social work would be stressed and that's clearly not the, the the case so we have to have a fuller a deeper understanding of what stress is and not mix it up with pressure um because pressure can be a positive thing it can motivate us it can be enriching whereas stress is where pressure reaches a level where it is causing harm where it is making us ill it's affecting the quality or quantity of our work. It's affecting our relationships. It's creating vicious circles and so on and so yeah. forth. Yeah, yeah. That, that is so, so well explained. So what do you think people should do to make sure they don't get stressed or that they're managing stress a lot better than they are? Well, I think the, the first thing is, you know, following on from just what I was saying a moment ago is to understand the difference between pressure and stress. Mm -hmm. People often talk loosely about stress to mean any sort of pressure. Um, and that's fine. I'm not saying they shouldn't do that. Um, but we have to recognize that in a technical, official or legal uh, uh, sense, mm -hmm. stress is where the pressure reaches a level that is causing us harm, where it is too much pressure, for example. Um, and so it's a problem. So when people say, for example, things like, well, stress is good for you, that's misleading because it's pressure that is good for you if that pressure is at a manageable level. But if the pressure has reached a level where it is making you ill, uh, reducing your effectiveness, affecting your relationships and so on and so forth, how could you possibly say that's good for you? Um, so first thing is be clear about Pressure is what we get paid for. Uh, any job, there will be pressure, and that's the deal. You take the pressure and you get the salary in, in ex exchange. Yeah. So we can't complain about being under pressure. But when the pressure gets so high that it is, um, as I say, affecting our health, quality of work, and so on, then that becomes a health and safety issue. Because what employers should not be doing is allowing their employees to be harmed by their job. Mm -hmm. So some people, for example, on training courses have said to me, but aren't you just um, playing with words there, Neil, about pressure and stress? And I've had to say, no, no, no. This distinction is crucial because if you're under pressure, that's what you get paid for. 
But if that pressure is reaching a level where it is harming you, you're not paid to be harmed by your work. Um, that is a breach of health and safety um, legislation. So, and that's to me is the distinction between pressure and stress in its formal technical um, uh, sense. There's a parallel here with the use of the word trauma. You know, that we um, will be clear that a trauma is a psychological wound, for example. It's not just something that's a bit distressing in its technical official sense. But you'll often hear people using trauma or traumatic in a much looser everyday sense. You know, you have people saying things like, oh, my commute into work was dreadful this morning. There was roadworks and there'd been an accident. It took twice as long as normal. It was quite traumatic. And of course it wasn't. It wasn't traumatic. It may have been a pain. It may have been distressing okay. even but it wasn't traumatic, it wasn't a trauma. But that's fine, if we know we're using the language loosely, no problem. But can you see how there's a direct parallel there in terms of stress? People often say things like, I'm stressed. And we have to stop and ask, are you stressed or are you under pressure? Are you coping with this? Is it um, harming you? And so if it is harming you, it's reached that level, then you have to do something about it. You have yeah. to take steps. Yeah. And one of the reasons for this is that the health and safety legislation applies to employees as well as employers. Mm -hmm. So if I were an employer, for example, I'm under a legal duty to safeguard my staff from undue hazards. But then on employees mm -hmm. are under a legal um, obligation to safeguard themselves from undue harm. So as an employer, I would have to make sure, for example, that um, electrical connections are properly earthed. Um, but then employees would have to make sure that they're using electrical equipment safely and sensibly. Mm -hmm. It's a shared responsibility. The same applies to stress. So that brings us back to this idea of self-care, that people have to take self-care seriously. So coming back to your question about, you know, what steps do people need to, to take? Basically, it's about be clear. Are you stressed or is it just an uncomfortable level of pressure? And if it is stressed, then it has to be taken seriously as a health and safety um, matter. Yeah. So I love that. I love that. And you, there are a couple of things that you said that I just want to go back to because you spoke oh. about there's this thing about taking responsibility and ownership and it's a dual process. It isn't just your employer, you know, it, to, to some extent, you know, you've got cases coming in you have to allocate them out, right? Unless you get, uh, there have been some places I've been in where they say, okay, we are, we're closing our doors because we can't take any more. Um, that's a rarity because if you're in a lot of social works, I speak to on the front line. So then the referral and assessment, that often case does not happen where they just shut the doors. The long-term teams can do it, but you can't at the front door. And so, you know, in as much as, yes, the employers have a responsibility, um, I always tell social workers, you also have a responsibility to say, I can take no more. And you've spoken about that and touched upon that and understanding the difference between stress and pressure. And this is something that I talk about a lot to my social workers about being clear, what are you feeling? Naming your feelings, being able to um, share them, um, knowing the difference between your feelings and why you're feeling the way you're feeling. Those are really important steps in terms of the work that we do in the frontal lobe, in emotional intelligence, and how we're then perceiving the situation. So I think you've picked up on some really key things there that I think really contribute to the stress that social workers do feel um, when you're internalizing something that isn't really as stressful as you're making it out to be, you're adding to your problem as opposed to using emotional intelligence that tells you I've got the resources to deal with this. Um, and then that frees you up to, to really know when you're really in that stressful mode where the pressure is turned up and where you need to be saying to your manager, I need, actually need to take time off. So I think it, those are brilliant, brilliant things that you've drawn out. So what about supporting others? Because we're talking about managers supporting, you know, social workers and 
uh, social workers supporting themselves and advocating for themselves. Mm. But what about supporting others and, and how important is that? Um, well, taking the second bit uh, first, how important it is, it's crucial as far as I'm uh, con concerned. Mm -hmm. One of the things I've been talking a lot about to various people lately is what I um, refer to as the uh, continuum or spectrum of well-being interventions. And what I mean by that continuum is that most of the stuff tends to be around individuals. So if you look at how to cope with stress, that sort of thing, um, time and workload management, all those issues tend to focus on the individual. There are, um, you know, huge numbers of books being written on that subject around these um, issues, but they all seem to imply that it's all about individual matters. Now, what I want, want to do in terms of this idea of the continuum of uh, well-being interventions is mm -hmm. to move, broaden that out. So the next step along the way, as it were, from the individual is the team. And I think there has to be team support. People have to support one another. And in particular, they have to be tuned into that culture. Okay. So if there is a culture of negativity, defeatism, cynicism, a culture that takes it for granted. If you work here, you're going to be stressed. Just get used okay. to it, which is yeah. sadly something I've come across uh, a lot. Um, and uh, if people are feeding that culture, keeping it alive, as it were, then that does a lot of harm. Or if people are actually challenging that culture, trying to change it, then that can do a lot of good. People can feel much more supportive. If people are saying, hey, we're under a hell of a lot of pressure at the moment, let's pull together and support one another, rather than reinforce this idea that, well, you're going to get stressed, just face it, um, which is very, very dangerous assumption to um, uh, make. For example, I've done a lot of work with um, uh, students who have told me that when they've been out on placement, they've really struggled for that reason, that they have been basically told, well, if you're gonna be a social worker, you're gonna be stressed, just get used to it. And I've taught them about this difference between pressure and stress. And they've, they've told me that, that they've struggled with that when they're on placement because there is this tendency to mix up pressure and stress and people to say, you're going to be stressed. It's the technical term for it is normalization. That yeah. stress becomes normalized and it shouldn't be. Stress is basically a breach of health and safety. It's basically saying there are things going on in this organization that are harmful to health and safety. Mm -hmm. So the team is the next on the level of this continuum of well-being interventions. But then I think you need to look at the whole organization. You'll make it wider still in terms of what is the culture of the organization? What is the quality of leadership? Um, are um, people in leadership positions actually making life easier for their staff or in some cases making things harder? Um, and then ideally, we should then take it beyond that into the world of work itself, you know, uh, which is now beginning to change in terms of issues around health and well-being taken more seriously, for example. Mm -hmm. But there is still this dominant way of thinking that the world of work is based on exploitation. So um, people in senior positions, whether they are owners, managers, whatever, um, will often think in terms of the relationship with the workforce is one of exploitation. How can we get as much out of people for as little cost as possible, which is creates negativity, it creates resentment, it creates sabotage, um, it demotivates, uh, it demoralizes people and so on. Whereas what I've been talking about in my work is think about it not as about exploiting employees, but exploiting opportunities for people to work together for mutual benefit. Mm -hmm. So we're talking about empowering staff rather than dumping work on them uh, and exploiting them. And so I hope that makes sense in terms of what yes. I a continuum of well-being interventions from individual support, team support, organizational support. And ideally, what we need to do is actually change the nature of the world of work to make Absolutely. it more user friendly in a sense. Absolutely. 
And I, I love everything that you said because, you know, again, you know that a lot of the work that I do with social workers who want to become independent, and when they come to me, we are talking a lot about self-care. There's always an element of self-care and what's going on in the, the, the um, workplace. And it is this organisational culture of pessimism of it's never got going to get any better. I just need to ride it out for as long as I can and then escape, right? And so I love the idea that you're talking about the them taking ownership, but also together, collectively being able to take ownership and supporting one another. Um, and then that filtering down even from the leadership downwards. Um, I think a lot of social workers also that come to me, they talk about feeling quite exploited, like getting squeezed for as much energy as they can possibly muster up. Um, you know, for as little as um, whatever they're given. And I think the same is true whether they're permanent workers or agency workers. I think people who are agency workers are really feeling the brunt um, and experiencing it. I know legislation has changed and they're, they, you know, they're under umbrella companies on a PAYE and they've, they've got entitlement to various other things, but they still feel as though they're out on a limb, they're on their own and they've just been exploited. So I think this thing around care and self-care is important. Um, um, and I think them having an understanding, I'm hearing a lot about you talking about having insight into what's happening and the process and, and that putting them in a position where they can make different decisions for themselves um, and then being supported in the organisation that they're in to actually do that. So I love that. Do you ever get stressed as an independent? Uh, no is, is the, the short answer. I get... Um because I do lots of different things for different people, um, sometimes I can get a bit of a log jam. Uh, mm -hmm. So I'm under a lot of pressure, you know, so for example, I may be busy on trying to meet a publisher's deadline and then uh, something else uh, crops up where I've got to do something uh, uh, quickly. And then I might have, cause I do a lot of, or have been doing a lot of expert witness work I may then get a, a, a letter or an email from a solicitor saying, thank you for the report you did six months ago. Um, we've now had a meeting with the barrister and we would like you to um, answer the following questions. And there's mm -hmm. 20 questions from the barrister. Yeah. Yeah. And they're saying, um, you know, ideally we'd like your re replies by next Tuesday. And I'm thinking, how am I going to fit that in? Um, so I am well well aware of pressure uh, I, I I get a lot of um, uh, pressure but I don't get stressed in the sense that I control that um, pressure yes. and that's one of the beautiful things about being independent of course yeah. but even if you're not independent even as a paid employee um, there are still things that you can do because one of the things I'm very aware of and I've been aware of literally for decades is when it comes to stress a key factor is control because if people feel they haven't got control, that's when the stress starts. When people feel uh, at risk, they feel vulnerable, they, they, they feel they can't protect themselves because this is something uh, beyond their um, uh, con control. Um, that can make a huge difference. So uh, you can have, for example, somebody who's under immense pressure, but they're not the slightest bit stressed because they have control over that pressure. You can have yeah. other people who are under quite a modest level of pressure, but they're quite stressed because they don't have control over that um, mm -hmm. pressure. So for me, a key aspect of it is is control, is to look yes. at what can you control and control it, make sure it happens. So it's that's part of the ownership, yeah. part of the empowerment, in a sense, is is control um, uh, what you can. Yes. Makes a huge um, uh, difference. And I think that goes back to what we were saying a little while ago about, you know, understanding how you're perceiving and what is the narrative that you're giving around the situation, because that helps you to put things into perspective to know, is this pressure or is this really a stressful situation? And that also is encompassed with feeling that control and saying, OK, now I know what it is. What can I do about it? And and feeling confident to do that. And, and I think part of it is also, Neil, having the resources. Once you've figured it out, it's now what 
what resources do we have? And I'm sure um, that's something when you talk about um, managers and organizations taking appropriate steps and creating the right culture, that it would include resources that help their staff manage. So this has been fascinating, a really, really deep dive into stress and understanding um, the importance of social workers managing stress, understanding the difference, and even to a greater extent, the organizational culture changing and really shifting, especially during this time where social workers are, are feeling very stressed, not just pressured, but very stressed, going off sick, um, and actually their work coming into their home. So their home is no longer sacred. Um, and I think there's a, this is a, the, like the right push at the right time for this kind of um, development in self-care. So it has been a wonderful conversation. I've enjoyed it. Thank you so much. Is there anything that you want to add before we wrap it up? Yeah, well, uh, thank you for that. Just a couple of things, uh, just uh, briefly. One is to uh, go back to the idea of organisational culture for a moment. Um, one thing I want to emphasise uh, there is that a lot of people have told me over the years that cultures take a long time to develop, therefore they take a long time to change. And I'm afraid that's just not true. Um, at the end of the day, a culture is just a set of habits. Cultures can't fight back. They are habits, unwritten rules, taken for granted assumptions. Cultures persist because people turn up on a Monday morning and carry on where they left off on Friday afternoon. The habits and, and practices can, can continue. Um, and so it's quite possible in, in most situations to change cultures quite quickly. So, for example, if you've got a culture where people don't communicate, you can change that culture by starting to communicate. If you have a culture where people do nothing but moan all day and don't do anything about it, you can change that culture by um, people not moaning and saying, OK, if we're not happy, what can we do about this? And doing what they can do. And if there's nothing they can do about it, then accepting that as inevitable and getting on with their lives. But just sitting around moaning about things they can't change, just yeah. feeds vicious circles, feeds yeah. cynicism and negativity yeah. and, and low um, uh, uh, morale. The yeah. thing that can stop cultures changing is vested interests in the mm. sense that if uh, it, it doesn't suit certain people for the culture to change, then they might resist that. But then that's something that can also be dealt with as well. But I just want people to not have this idea that a culture is something that's sort of written in tablets of stone and you just have to accept it. Um, that's the way it is. Cultures are just the dead weight of habit. They can change and, and sometimes very easily change if you know what you're doing. So, so that was one thing. The other thing was just to um, say that um, one of the books I've written is called the Managing Stress Practice Manual. So for anybody um, watching this who, who feels they want to know more, um, then th th I'd suggest that's where you look, the Managing Stress Practice um, Manual. You can get it from Amazon or from uh, my Academy website. Um, that's it. And then I suppose just to, uh, as well, just briefly to, to finish off is to say um, uh, I'm very active on uh, social media. So um, if people want to connect with me on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, YouTube, and so on, then I welcome that. And uh, you can also find out more about me and my work at neilthompson.info. So um, thanks. Uh, Nicole, that's been really helpful and I've enjoyed it. I've enjoyed it too. Thank you, Neil. It's been great. Speak to you again soon. Yeah. Cheers, Nicole. Thanks. Bye now. Cheers.